With the help of the Almighty, we are here. The final Parsha of this year's Torah reading cycle. The final podcast of this seventh cycle of the Parsha podcast. How fortunate are we? How lucky are we that we get to gather together every week and study the Almighty's holy Torah? Of course, year eight is in our sights and we have a plan, dad, deep and deeper to try to see a bit deeper beneath the surface to get into the text, the subtext and the substrate of the Parsha. But that, of course, is for next week with the help of the Almighty. We'll have Parshas Bereshis of year eight, but we are still in year seven, and we're at the finish line with the help of the Almighty. Now, before we begin, I have a very, very, very exciting announcement. For the first time, I'm revealing this for the very first time right here, right now. And that is for the past three years, I've been working on a new book, something which I think is going to be so impactful, so transformative, so powerful. I really legitimately think it can change the world. It's very different from my first book, Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp. I would say that the first book is, is a little bit more dense, more rigorous, maybe a book for the scholar. Unlike Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp, this book, which I have yet to reveal the name, this is a book for the masses, and it's designed to be completely, utterly life-changing. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the title is, but I'll give you the current working subtitle, just to whet your appetite. And this could still change, but I want to give you a sense of the scope of this project. The subtitle, the current working subtitle for my upcoming book, Please God, is A Robust Toolkit for How to Identify Your Unique Life Mission, How to Develop Your Potential, and How to Actualize the Greatness Destined for You. And I'm proud to announce today that I finished the outline of the book. Over a hundred chapters. This is a massive, massive project. Obviously, there's still a lot of writing to do. And I have a very ambitious writing plan for the fall, for the winter. And I'll give you, please God, a periodic update. But this is something that I've been working myself on. It's been under wraps for years now, and I'm excited to let you know about this momentous development. And without revealing too much, I will tell you, unwittingly and unknowingly, you, the Parsha Podcast audience, you played a very significant role in helping me get this far in this project. Now, I will tell you, I made a big mistake in the publishing of last book. You see, these books... They're meant for a small audience. It's a niche audience. Or, as some people say, it's a niche audience. Even the second book, which I say is a mass market, but it's still a Torah book. And it doesn't sell like a general audience book. It's a much, much smaller audience. Not only that, it's an over-served audience. There are a lot of Torah books out there. As such, what, what typically ends up happening is that the costs of producing the book are covered by donations. You know, you don't sell enough copies to, to really cover the expenses. So if you open up any Torah book, invariably the first couple of pages will be dedications. People want to support the great work. If you look at my previous book, I also secured some contributions to cover the expenses, but I made a mistake. A mistake that I'm not going to make a second time. My mistake was that I didn't reach out to y'all, the listeners of the Parsha podcast and all the other podcasts, to see if you'd be interested in supporting that project. But I'm not going to make the mistake again. And I will be asking. We'll talk more about it. Please, God. But I will be reaching out in the upcoming months to you to see if you're interested, perhaps, to help shepherd this project along. So this is exciting news. As we wrap up, the seventh cycle of the Parsha podcast. Now you know there's another mega project that is humming along as well. This monumental work, this transformative book, again, an outline of over a hundred chapters 
is complete. And I hope and I pray that this book will make an enormous life-changing impact to help people. And again, the, the subtitle, a robust toolkit for how to identify your unique life mission, how to develop your potential, and how to actualize the greatness destined for you. Again, the, the, the subtitle may change, but you know we're talking big. You know we're serious about this project. With the help of the Almighty, we will succeed in bringing it to the finish line. And of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. So our Parsha, the final Parsha of the Torah, we're at the end. And Moshe is on the last day of his life. And he gathers the nation together. And he gives a blessing to the tribes. Every tribe, with the exception of Shimon, every tribe is told, is guided, is directed, is blessed by Moshe. And the Midrash tells us that Moshe's deathbed blessing is reminiscent of Jacob's. At the end of Genesis, Jacob's about to die. And before his death, he gathers his sons and he blesses them and he instructs them as to how to properly design their life. Of course, everyone's different and everyone needs to tailor their life in a different way. And Jacob, the patriarch, the prophet, he spoke to every one of his sons and guided and directed each one of them in the proper way to maximize their unique qualities for good. And also, he informed them of their shortcomings and flaws so that they can set up a life that avoids constantly running into those obstacles. That was Jacob at the end of his life. And now Moshe, at the end of his follows suit and he blesses the nation at the point where Jacob left off. And in fact, the Midrash says that when the, when the verse concludes the blessing of Jacob, it says, Vizos, and this is what their father said to them. This is in Genesis 49, 28. The very first word of our parsha, Vizos, and this is the blessing that is an indication, says the Midrash, that Moshe is picking up exactly where Jacob left off. Jacob tells his sons, Vizos, this is the blessing. But you should know, in the future, there will be another man like me. That's Moshe. And where I stop with the word Vizos, he will begin, he will commence with the same word, Vizos, Vizos Habracha. Now, Moshe doesn't just continue the blessing of Jacob. He actually works off the content, the theme of Jacob's blessing to each one of his sons. Moshe expands upon that, upon that theme for the respective tribes that have now been spawned from said sons. If you look at Rashi in verse 13, Rashi tells us that in all the tribes, the blessing of Moshe is similar is on the same theme, is on the same point as the blessing of Jacob. Jacob was speaking to his sons. And now Moshe is extending the blessing that Jacob assigned to the individual progenitors of these tribes. Now Moshe is expanding that same blessing or that theme, that same theme, to the tens of thousands of members of said tribes. And again, each tribe is different, just as every person is different. And just as every person has their own unique life mission, every tribe has their more generalized tribal mission. The commentaries tell us that in heaven, there are 12 gates, one for every tribe. Every tribe has to enter heaven in a different way, in a different path. Of course, we know that every tribe was accorded a parcel of land in Canaan, and that was done prophetically. It's not just about real estate. It's not just about having some land to live. It's about tailoring the tribal mission to the land that is best suited for said tribe to actualize said mission. So this is what Moshe is doing over here. He's revealing to each tribe what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and what is their unique way of advancing the general cause of the nation. Just like Jacob, he wasn't just giving random blessings to his sons. Moshe is not giving random blessings 
to the tribes, he's given very targeted blessings. Every tribe, you have to know what your particular tribe needs to do, what you need to contribute, what you need to excel at, what you need to focus on. After all, you're on the doorstep of entering the land. What do you need to emphasize? What does your tribe need to do? What is your tribal mission? Jacob revealed the qualities and some of the flaws, but he revealed what made every one of his sons special. In the words of the Kabbalists, he revealed to each one of them the roots of their soul and guided them how to channel that towards the service of God. And that was for the individuals. And now the sons of Jacob have burgeoned into a great nation. And Moshe is following Jacob's lead and he's guiding each tribe. Ramban calls the tribes a mini nation, each mini nation amidst the greater nation of Israel. He's telling them, he is instructing them and guiding them how they ought to deploy their tribal qualities in service of God and in fulfillment of their tribal mission. And today I want to focus on the blessing accorded to the tribe of Levi in particular. At the end of Moshe's life, he gives a blessing, starts with Reuven, goes to Judah, and he heaps praise on Levi. Moshe lavishly praises the tribe of Levi. And he notes this is the tribe that the Kohanic family comes from, the ones who wear the Urim and the Tum, the special element of the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol. And that was given to this family not by chance. They are the devout ones. They were tested repeatedly, and they withstood the test. And then Moshe focuses on the role of the Levites in quashing the rebellion at the sin of the golden calf. You recall what happened during the golden calf. Moshe is up in heaven to get the tablets from the Almighty. At that time, the nation commits this horrific crime of the golden calf. And Moshe descends with the tablets and he finds Joshua at the foot of the mountain. And they have a bit of a discussion about the noises emanating from the camp. And together they go to the camp and they find the nation reveling, celebrating with the golden calf. And Moshe shatters the tablets, and he grinds the golden calf into dust, and he puts the dust in the water, and he makes the nation drink from the water as if they were a sota. And then Moshe issues a clarion call. Mi lahashem elai, who is loyal to God? Come and join me. And the entire tribe of Levi joined him. And he tells them, gird your swords and traverse the camp, and kill, and summarily execute anyone who participated in this sin. Whether or not they are family members, your brothers, your relatives. And the Levites listened. They killed the perpetrators, even if they were family members. That is what we're told in Exodus chapter 32. This is verses 26 through 29. And now Moshe is praising them for that. This is chapter 33 of Devarim, verse 9. The Levites who said to their father and to their mother, I don't see you. And to their brother, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. And to their sons, I don't know you. For you guarded the word of God and you protected his covenant. Rashi explains that when the nation participated in the sin of the golden calf, no Levites actually committed that sin. But some Levite relatives did. So, suppose you have a Levite whose mother is a non-Levite, and his maternal grandfather participated in that sin. The Levite who joined Moshe's call who was loyal to God, come join me. He was even willing to kill his grandfather. And what about his brother, his half-brother? His his mother is a non-Levite, and he has a half-brother who is a non-Levite. Again, it can't be any Levites, because the Levites did not participate at all in this sin. 
Would you kill your half-brother? Moshe says, the verse tells us, that the Levites said to the brothers, I don't recognize you. If you're guilty, I don't care about you. Or maybe I do care about you, but I'm going to execute you nonetheless. And your son, suppose your daughter married a non-Levite, and thus you have a grandson who is a non-Levite. And if they did the sin of the golden calf, you will tell your son, i.e. your grandson, I don't know you. This tribe, they guarded the word of the Almighty. God said not to have any foreign gods. And this tribe, they upheld the will of God. And they protected the covenant in the wilderness when it was considered to be dangerous to circumcise their sons. The Levites did it nonetheless. And therefore, continues Moshe, verse 10, they will have roles of judgment, of Torah leadership. They will be the priests. They'll, they'll do the sacrifices, the incense offerings. These special designations are going to be given to the tribe of Levi. Torah leadership, the right to judge the nation and priesthood. Why? Because of their bravery and heroism and gallantry. In the aftermath of the golden calf, Moshe issued a call. Who is loyal to God? Come join me. And the Levites took up arms even against their own family. And when there were risks of doing circumcision in the wilderness, they didn't care. They risked their own children for the loyalty to God, and that's why they were chosen. Concludes Moshe's message to the Levites, you are brave, you are heroic, you are the army of God, and God will bless his army. That is the blessing accorded to the tribe of Levi. And we have some questions. Three questions, to be precise. The first question is a general question. Jacob did a grand service for his sons. He was a prophet. And he was able to prophetically intuit, understand, know, see what every one of his sons needed to do? What what was their mission in life? What were their strengths and weaknesses and how they must design their lives to maximize and optimize it for the service of God? And he was able to guide them and direct each one of them on a path that is fitting for them. And Moshe continued where Jacob left off. He expanded the blessing of Jacob. Jacob gave it to his sons. And now Moshe expanded it to the respective tribes that these sons spawned. But what about us? We also have a mission. Otherwise, what are we doing here? We also have a path that we must take. But we don't have a Jacob or a Moshe to guide us. Now, there is a famous comment in the Gona Vilna's commentary to Proverbs, where he says that the role of prophets throughout the centuries, you know, we, we know some of the famous prophets, and we have some of their writings, of course. But the primary role of prophets was this, to guide every individual as to what the root of their soul was, what their unique life mission was, and to direct them on the path for them to actualize that. But what can we do? We've been a non-profit, spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-T, a non-profit organization, a religion without seers, for more than 2,000 years. How can we get some of this valuable guidance absent a prophet and, dare I say, before the book on this subject is published. How can we receive what the sons of Jacob got from their father? How do we find direction without a prophet? Question number one. Question number two, Levi. Moshe surveys the tribe of Levi and he praises them specifically for taking up arms against their own family. 
Their loyalty to God, Moshe says, overrides their loyalty to their family. The ones who said to their fathers and the mothers, I don't see you. And their brothers, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. And to the sons, I don't know you. This is the great accomplishment of the tribe of Levi. And this is what rendered them deserving of the great offices of leadership. And here's the question. Moshe's blessing, Rashi tells us, the Midrash tells us, it's supposed to be a continuation of Jacob's. It's supposed to take where Jacob left off and expand it and augment it, not just to the family, but to the whole tribes, to the whole nation now. But if you look at what Jacob said to Levi and what Moshe said to the Levite nation, to the Levite mini-nation, to the Levite tribe, they're almost exactly contradictory. What did Jacob tell Levi? So perhaps you recall, end of Genesis. He lumped Shimon and Levi together. Shimon and Levi Achim, you are brothers. But your weaponry is stolen craft. Shimon and Levi were notorious co-conspirators. They deceived the people of the city of Shechem, convinced them all to circumcise. And when, when they were weak and when they were vulnerable, they slaughtered the entire city. And then they proposed initially to murder Joseph, but then they sold him as a slave. And Shimon and Levi are brothers. They're a tag team. On Jacob's deathbed, he rebuked these two brothers. And he lumped them together. Your brothers, you are a unit. Two brothers motivated by brotherhood. They didn't take lightly any slights to their family. When their sister Dina was kidnapped, was raped, they deceived the city to circumcise and they slaughtered every man in the city. Why did they utilize such disproportionate use of force? What is their justification for their behavior? So they said, they made our sister like a harlot. They took family very seriously. If you mess with our sister, then your blood is on your head. You and all your countrymen are dead. Same thing with their crimes against Joseph. Joseph is young, is petulant perhaps, has megalomaniacal dreams, and he's causing rifts in the family. He's bad-mouthing the brothers to, to Jacob. And Shimon and Levi, they cannot tolerate Joseph threatening the well-being, the viability of the family. And they initially want to just get rid of him. And they ultimately settle for selling him as a slave for 20 pieces of silver. And again, why? Because Shimon and Levi are brothers. And these brothers are totally intolerant to anything that they deemed to destabilize their family. And even Joseph was not spared their wrath. And Jacob told them, you are brothers. But he gave them a stinging rebuke. Your craft is stolen from Asaph. Yes, brotherhood and kinship is important. But when you slaughter an entire city and you desire to murder, but you sell Joseph as a slave, these tactics don't come from me, says Jacob. They are the craft of Asaph, and therefore I want no part of their future crimes. When Korach, the heir to Levi, when he commits his crime, his rebellion, he is not attributed to Jacob. When Zimri, the heir of Shimon, he commits his crime, that is not attributed to Jacob either. It does not come from him, it comes from Asaph. That was the content of Jacob's blessing, it's called a blessing, to Levi, at the end of Genesis. And again, he highlights that Levi is a brother. He's motivated by brotherhood. He's intolerant of anything that destabilizes said family. Levi's a brother. And he acts in ways to preserve the kinship and the family. What does Moshe highlight? It seems like Whereas Jacob is highlighting Levi's commitment to family, 
Moshe is focusing on the exact opposite. He's highlighting Levi, the tribe now, Levi's greatness, and he emphasizes Levi's apathy to his family. He doesn't care about family. He tells his father, his mother, I don't see you. His brother, I don't recognize you. His son, I don't know you. Moshe is supposed to continue what Jacob did, but he highlights the exact opposite in the tribe of Levi of what Jacob highlights. Jacob emphasizes Levi's fidelity to family, whereas Moshe highlights Levi's willingness to take up arms against family. So what happened to Levi? What happened in between the blessing, the so-called blessing of Jacob and the blessing of Moshe? What do we make of Levi's metamorphosis? How exactly did Levi change? And finally, a third question. There is an iconic comment in the works of Rambam. At the end of his laws of Shemitah and Yovel, if you've ever had the great privilege of studying in the yeshiva, it's very likely you've heard this citation in Rambam quoted many, many times. Rambam was talking about how the tribe of Levi was not given their own lands in Canaan. They got cities, but not an entire tribal land. Nor did they get the spoils of war from what the nation plundered in their conquest. And why? Why didn't, this is a quote, why didn't Levi merit in the inheritance of the land and in its plunder? Because he was separated to serve God, to worship God, and to instruct the ways of God, the righteous ways of God and his laws to the masses. And he quotes our verse. This is in Devarim 33.10, where Moshe tells the Levites, you will instruct the commandments of God to Jacob and his Torah to Israel. And therefore, Levi is separated from the ways of the world. They don't go to war like the rest of the nation, and they don't merit the benefits of war. They don't inherit the land in war. Instead, they are servants of God. They're part of the army of God. And God says, you're taking care of my agenda, I will take care of yours. God is their portion, and God will give them an inheritance. So this seems to fit very much with what Moshe is telling the tribe of Levi. But that's not why this Rambam is so famous. He continues, and he says that whatever we just said about the tribe of Levi, it's not exclusively the domain of the Levites. It's not just the tribe of Levi that has this special designation. Rather, every single person, any person in the entire world who has an ascendant spirit and undertakes a mission based upon their own insight to separate themselves, to designate themselves, to stand before God, to serve Him and to worship Him to know God and to go in God's ways. And someone who removes the shackles of the yoke of the world. And they say, I want to be like like a Levite. Behold, this person comes sanctified with the Holy of Holies. And God is his portion. And God is his inheritance forever and ever. This is the problematic comment in Rambam. Yes, it's true. The tribe of Levite does not have ancestral lands in the land of Canaan. And yes, it's true, they don't go to war, and they don't merit to partake in the booty that is plundered during war. And why? The verse says, because of their heroism, because they answered Moshe's call 
in the aftermath of the golden calf. And they took up arms against their own family, and they guarded the covenant of God. Well, only the Levites did that. How can Rambam say that the status of a Levi, that our verse tells us they earned it, why do they merit to instruct the nation? Why are they different? Because of the events in the aftermath of the golden calf and the fact that they circumcised their sons, notwithstanding the entailed danger. If so, how can Rambam say that every person in the world, he doesn't even say every Jewish person, every person in the world can achieve the status of a Levi? Rambam seems to violate our parsha. Here we're given a specific set of reasons why the Levites tower above all the other tribes. Their their heroism, the circumcision, when everyone else was scared to do it, the heroism in the aftermath of the golden calf. Moshe made the call, everyone came, all the Levites joined him, and they didn't care about their family. And because of that, the verse says, they became worthy of teaching the nation of being God's cherished close ones above all others. How does Rambam write? that this designation is available to all. So I want to suggest an approach, one that will answer all three questions. Question number one, how do we find life guidance absent a prophet and until the book is published? Number two, how do we explain Levi's about face when it comes to family from the blessing of Jacob to the blessing of Moshe? And number three, how do we understand Rambam's puzzling statement that the status of Levi is available to all? I think there's a very deep point over here. We talk a lot about the notion of individuality. Everyone's different. Everyone has different qualities and different shortcomings, of course. And everyone has to find a way to discover their life mission, to tailor their life in a way that is unique to them, to use your unique qualities, your unique characteristics in service of God. That's what Jacob offered his sons. And that's what Moshe did for the tribes in our Parsha. And the Gona Villa tells us that that's what prophets did for the nation over the course of centuries. But Levi's different. Levi's different. Jacob tells Levi, you have an attribute of brotherhood. You are a brother. And you're not going to stand idly when this brotherhood and kinship is being threatened. Comes along Moshe, and he highlights completely contradictory behavior. He praises the Levites that they killed their own family members. Wait a minute. I thought Levites have a preternatural affinity for family. That's what Jacob told us. And here they are seemingly repudiating that quality. What changed? What happened to the Levites in between? What happened is the Levites answered the call. Moshe said, who is loyal to God? Come to me. And the Levites were summoned, and they joined, and they answered the call. And Moshe said, go kill your family members. Go execute those who are guilty of this horrendous crime that threatens the viability of the nation. And the people said, the Levites said, we are loyal to God above all. That became the designation of the Levites. Everyone else has a mission. It's a specific mission. Find your qualities. Find your flaws. Find what makes you different. Find what makes you unique. And find a way to carve out, based upon your newfound knowledge, carve out the particular path that you must take. The Levites are loyal to God. And they don't operate in this manner, in this, in this, in this way of thinking. They don't say, well, what are my qualities and how can I best use them to the service of God? They start from the opposite end of that calculus. Whatever God needs, I'm ready. 
My loyalty is to God above everything else. That is the level of the Levites. It's not based upon their characteristics, their aptitude, their inclinations, their predispositions, their unique circumstances. All that is discarded. It's just about what does God need? I am part of his army. Again, this is what Moshe says. God will bless his army. Soldier. A soldier doesn't say, well, my uh, you know, my particular skill set has me doing something else. No, no, no. A soldier follows orders and doesn't think about their individuality. They're a cog working for a bigger plan. The Levites were willing to discard their individuality. And their individuality said family above everything else. Along the way, between the blessing of Jacob and the blessing of Moshe, they pivoted and they effectively repudiated their individuality and they adopted this loyalty to God above all. If you think about it, Issachar, Issachar, both in the blessing given to him by Jacob and in the blessing given to the tribe of Issachar, of Issachar, by Moshe, they're highlighting the fact that this tribe is a tribe of scholars. And they're a tribe of judges. So both Levi is told that he's going to be a judge and Yisachar, Issachar is, is going to be a judge. They're both judges, but from different orientations. Yisachar was always destined to be a judge. He was an analytical mind. He was someone who was maybe a bit more academic and scholastic. And he became a judge because that is his aptitude. That is his characteristic. That is what he's, his unique role is. That, that's his life mission. Levi is also going to be the tribe of scholars and judges, not because they have a preternatural predisposition to that, but because that is what is needed. And they do what is needed. When there is a call, they answer. And they don't think, well, am I the right person for this kind of a job? Is this really what my qualities are pushing me towards? No. They are just always ready to answer the call. The nation was accorded land in Israel. And this division of the land was done prophetically. And of course, as we mentioned, it's not about real estate. It was about every tribe was given their individual tribal land because that is the place where they can best achieve their individual tribal mission. But Levi does not have a portion in the land. And the question can be raised, well, if every individual's portion in the land is uniquely tailored and suited for them to achieve their mission, well, why is Levi excluded? And here's the answer. Levi did not have land a portion to their tribe because they never had a specific mission. And their mission is always not, what's my aptitude? What's my skill? What's my unique characteristic, what are the attributes that I've been endowed with? It's all about need. Is there a need? Whenever there's a need, whatever the mission of God may be at a given moment, they are always ready to contribute. Whenever there's a call, they answer. When the nation needed conscripts for the war against Midian, this is in Bamidbar chapter 31, Rashi tells us there were 12,000 conscripts from 12 tribes. And then there was another thousand Levites. But the 12,000 armed men, they had to be given over. They had to be conscripted. The Levites were always ready to go. The Levites don't have a specific mission. They have a universal mission. And their mission is loyalty to God. Who is loyal to God? Come join me. Whatever's needed, even if it violates my unique orientation, my unique predisposition, 
the Levites are always ready. Whenever there's a job to get done, the Levites answer the call. They don't have a specific land because they have no specific mission. And the Ram tells us that this mission is still available to us. We don't need a prophet for this. We don't need Moshe. We don't need Jacob or any other prophet throughout our history. Every single person in the world can still join the Levite army. And yes, they displayed this with the behavior that they had in the aftermath of the golden calf. But that's not just a specific mission. That is a demonstration of the quality of Levi. I am loyal to God. I'm willing to do whatever it takes, whether or not it fits into my particular character profile. Today, we don't have the ancestral lands in Israel. We don't even know what tribe we're part of. And we certainly don't have any prophets. And we don't know what our individual mission is. Maybe there are other ways to figure it out. We'll have to wait and see on that. But what we know for sure is that all of us can still always have the Levite mission. And that mission states, whatever God needs, whenever there's a call, who is loyal to God? The Levites answer. And anyone who does answer in the affirmative, in the words of the Rambam, they are holy of holies. We like to end off the Parsha podcast, at least this cycle, with a question. And this is the final question, with the help of the Almighty, of this Parsha podcast cycle. And we're going to focus on the final verse of the Torah. After Moshe passes, after he is buried, the Torah eulogizes Moshe. And it says, to Moshe's strong hand, and to the great power and miracles that he did and performed before the eyes of all of Israel. What does this mean? What's the strong hand and great power and feats that Moshe performed before the eyes of all of Israel? So Rashi tells us the strong hand, that refers to Moshe receiving the tablets. And this is an inference to the Midrash that tells us that at the time of the transfer of the tablets from God to Moshe, when the tablets were still partially in God's hands and partially in Moshe's, precisely at that point, the nation did the sin of the golden calf. And as a result, God wanted to withdraw the tablets. And a tug of war ensued. Moshe, was pulling the tablets, and God was pulling them to God, so to speak. And Moshe displayed a strong hand. He overpowered God, so to speak. And he yanked the Torah away, the tablets away from God. That is what it means that Moshe had a strong hand. And what are these great feats that Moshe did before the eyes of all of Israel? That too refers to Moshe's behavior with this tablets, with these tablets. The verse tells us that Moshe shattered the tablets before the eyes of all of Israel. And that is what the Torah is praising him at the very end of the Torah, that Moshe took those tablets that he, so to speak, overpowered God and withdrew them from God, he takes it and he shatters it. The final words of the Torah, the final praise of Moshe, the capstone of Moshe's greatness, is that he shattered the tablets. This is the pinnacle that Moshe shattered the tablets. This is the greatest accomplishment of Moshe's life. And obviously this whole subject is Difficult for us to understand. How is it appropriate to shatter the tablets? Think about it. The tablets made by God, etched by God. To throw them on the floor? To shatter them? It's obviously a very difficult thing to understand. But also, how is this the 
peak of Moshe's life. This is the greatest achievement of his life. And finally, why are you seizing them from God, overriding, so to speak, the will of God, only to shatter them? There's something very deep and very beautiful going on over here. After the nation commits the sin of the golden calf, God wanted to withdraw the tablets. Why? This nation has rendered itself undeserving, unworthy of the tablets. And Moshe begins pulling in the opposite direction. Does he disagree? Does Moshe think that the nation is deserving? It can't be. After all, he takes the tablets and he shatters them. So obviously Moshe agreed with God that the nation is undeserving of the tablets of Torah. But nevertheless, Moshe still overpowered God's opposition, so to speak, and grabbed the tablets with his strong hand. The disagreement was not about what the nation was deserving of Torah. Everyone agreed that they could not have it. The only difference in opinion between God and Moshe was that God wanted the tablets to remain in heaven. And Moshe wanted shattered tablets to be given to the nation. And this is Moshe's greatest accomplishment, that the nation has the shards of the tablets. What happened to those tablets? What happened to the broken pieces of the tablets that Moshe shattered? We know. They were placed in the ark alongside the second set of tablets that were intact. And the Talmud tells us that this is a very powerful lesson. If you see a Torah scholar who forgot all of their Torah and they're completely bereft of Torah, you must nevertheless accord them honor because they are like the broken shards of the tablets that are in the ark alongside the intact set of tablets. A Torah scholar who forgot all of their Torah is like the broken set of tablets that are in the same ark alongside the non-broken set of tablets. Moshe wanted us to have the status of broken tablets. We had the Torah and we lost it. That's very different than someone who has never had Torah and has no place in the ark. The broken tablets, they still command a certain status because of what they were previously. Someone who is a broken tablet, so to speak, the Torah is still associated with them. They may be completely empty of Torah, but because they had it at one point, some of that influence lives on. Moshe's greatest accomplishment was the shattering of the tablets. Moshe achieved that even after the most grievous sin, the golden calf, Even after we were rendered undeserving of Torah, we still maintain some association with it. The imprint of Sinai is still forever indelibly found upon the heart of every Jew. No matter how far someone may be from Torah, no matter how shattered their tablets are, no matter how undeserving a person is of Torah, Even the worst sins, the most distance, cannot eradicate the fact that the Torah is forever embedded in their hearts, whether they know it or not. I think there's a beautiful way to end off year seven of the Parsha podcast. We get to study the Almighty's Torah. The time that we're going to read this Parsha, 
V'zos ha-bracha. We're going to finish this cycle of Torah. That is on Simcha's Torah, the day that we dance with the Torah. Our nation is the only nation that dances with our books. We have this emotional bond, this emotional affinity with the Torah that doesn't die out. The flame of this relationship has not dampened in 3,300 years. It's an unbelievable thing. We're still dancing with it. There's no erosion to this relationship. Why? Because no matter where we may be, no matter how shattered we may be, so to speak, we still find some place alongside the tablets, the intact tablets of God. We have a great privilege to be able to study Torah together each week. How fortunate are we? But even our brethren who are very distant and they're not studying Torah and they're not engaging with their soul and they're not engaging with their rich and glorious heritage and they don't know the beauty of the Almighty's Torah and this wonderful mission that began with Abraham and endures until this day. They're not that far. They're not that distant. They still are considered, thanks to the intercession of Moshe, there's still a little bit of the impact of the influence of Sinai within them. They may be shattered. Their tablets may be beyond recognition, but they're still there in their heart. And that flame that may be completely imperceptible, it is not beyond conception that it can be fanned to life. This was an absolute joy to study this Parsha and all 54 Parsha sections of the Torah with y'all on the Parsha podcast. On year seven, here from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, my name is Yaakov Wolby. I'm the proud host of the Parsha podcast. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I want to hear from you. Reach out. Send me an email. I'm excited for next year. For next week. For year eight, please get out of the Parsha podcast. Until then, have an amazing rest of your day. Rest of your Sukkot festival. Have a joyous, exuberant Simchas Torah. And please, God, we will gather together again for year eight of the Parsha podcast next week.